This is the DeFi Decoded Podcast by Nine Point Partners in cooperation with Prophecy DeFi. The ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast should not be taken as investment advice. Always consult with your financial advisor before investing. Hi, and welcome to another episode of DeFi Decoded. I'm Alex Tapscott here with Andrew Young. And today we're talking about uh, Web3 Gaming. Recently, we spoke to Ben Lee of Blowfish Studios about his view on the present and future of blockchain games, where he describes some new concepts for our audience, like play to earn. And this week, we're going even deeper into this world of Web3 Gaming with a deep dive on what are so-called gaming guilds. Now, our guest this week is really the perfect person to talk about this with. Uh, Mitch Penman Allen is the co-founder of Parian DAO, which is a multi-role NFT gaming organization specializing in NFT leasing, esports, content creation, and venture capitalism. Prior to his time at Parian, Mitch founded his own proprietary trading firm specializing in delta neutral and quantitative strategies within the crypto asset futures and options markets. So there's lots of different things that we're trying to untangle here with uh, blockchain gaming. Obviously, we know from the discussion with Ben that certain kinds of games require a big upfront injection of capital or a big investment on behalf of gamers to really put themselves in the gameplay in order to earn these kinds of rewards. And that's where these gaming guilds have, have stepped in. Now, it's not as easy as just signing up to a gaming guild and you know earning a share of the profit. Um, gaming guilds have become their own cottage industry where there's real expertise, like the kind that Parian is bringing to the table. So that's what we're going to talk about that amongst many other things. I hope we have kind of a general discussion too about your views on, on gaming and the like. Um, but Mitch, thanks for joining the show. Yeah, no worries, guys. Thanks. To, uh, it's great to be here. And um, yeah, looking forward to talking more about um, about the space. We think it's um, probably one of the most exciting things to happen in recent times in crypto. So yeah, happy to be here. Well, it's actually interesting. We did our predictions for 2022 episode, the beginning of the year. And we said that blockchain gaming or play to earn gaming was going to be, you know, one of the big drivers of ma mass adoption um, in the same way that NFTs help to popularize digital goods with a certain kind of audience of, of people. Um, and I, I want to know how you came to this part of the crypto industry, because I mentioned in the in the outset that you founded your own pr prop trading firm doing, you know, head, you know, hedge fund type strategies, basically. Um, and then and, and now we're into um, into blockchain game. So tell us about your yeah. personal journey. How did you get into this? Yeah, it's funny. I've gone from like very TradFi kind of entry point to like the, the, the bleeding edge. Um, so it's a funny story. A friend of mine, um, actually, he was on a, a kite surfing trip. It was either in Bali or uh, Sri Lanka. And he met uh, Willie Wu, who's obviously like a, a pretty big trader. Um, and sort of connected myself and, and Willie. Willie had this uh, group for a bunch of sort of friends and family where he talked. Um, it was a lot around like uh, crypto ICOs and a little bit of trading. But um, I was obsessed with the trading side. And so I would just constantly ask questions for, with some of the trading guys in there. And um, yeah, within sort of two years, I had become that obsessed that I'd spent the last two years uh, just reading as much literature as I could around financial markets, um, mostly futures with a little bit of options. Um, and so, yeah, by 2019, I was uh, running my own prop trading firm, um, mostly just me. I'm just running the book there, uh, working with some computer scientists to create back testing engines and things like that. But uh, yeah, that was my entry into um, into crypto, which is probably uh, more on the yeah more on the trading side. I, I just found the kind of competitive nature of it really fun, um, and I figured like most people say they're making money, but they're not. So that's why I really I liked it. Um, and yeah, uh, in sort of 2020, I moved to uh, Melbourne, uh, Melbourne, Australia, which is a really nice spot. But uh, we went into one of the harshest lockdowns in the world. Um, now, one of the only reasons we could leave our house was to walk our dogs. So I was walking the dog one day and um, this little whippet ran up to me. <laughs> and uh, it turns out it belongs to Amos, who's another one of the co-founders of Perion. Now, um, Amos was a Web3 developer and he was working uh, for a crypto brokerage at the time. Um, and I was super interested in poaching him for what I was doing in the, in the futures markets. Uh, concurrently, Amos had reached a uh, number one position. After, this is after like, this is mid-2021, Amos had reached uh, number one in the world at Axie Infinity and um, told me all about the leasing model, uh, how it worked, and sort of like, like you guys came to the conclusion, we figured this would be the mass onboarding into crypto. Uh, so we just dove in. Um, so I still 
run the uh, the firm on the side. Like it's it's mostly just automated through algorithms right now. But um, yeah, we're all in Perion and we're um, super excited about the space. I feel like a lot of success stories in this industry start with, you know, I went deep and, and spent two years reading. But I always wonder, what are people doing in those two years? Like they can't be at home just reading white papers. Were you like flipping burgers? Were you working at, you know, an accounting firm? Like, did you have a day job when you started to get into all this kind of stuff? Yeah, sure. So um, I used to, I had a pretty high paying job in the oil and gas industry. Um, so sort of climbed the ladder there and realized like, I do not want to go out like this. Um, so yeah, it, that, that's sort of where I was at. Um, and I, I did that sort of on and off. Um, but a lot of the time I was just like living overseas. Like I had a pretty good pool of savings. So um, like I spent like six months living in Bali, just studying there. And yeah, that's yeah. sort of, um, the, yeah, it was, um, it was an interesting time. <laughs> That's cool. So, um, you, you know, Axie Infinity, you mentioned, um, is one of these like super viral success stories of the crypto world that help, does help to onboard, you know, a lot of new users to the space. Um, when would you say you had your aha moment where the idea for Parian DAO, the idea of doing, well, I know it's multifaceted, but we are here to talk about gaming guilds. Like when did that concept really crystallize for you? Yeah, look, I think that there was that leasing model that we'd seen. I think only like YGG and a, and a couple of other organizations were doing Actually, you know what, Mitch, can you act, uh, describe what is the leasing model precisely? 100%, yeah. Right. So yeah. Um, it's really quite simple. It sounds complex, but there's actually even no sort of crypto um, aspect involved in it in terms of the actual smart contracts um, side of things. So, so what happens is a, a player will come to us. Um, he'll want to join the organization. Um, we usually vet them pretty heavily. So we look at uh, mostly players from like League of Legends and Dota 2. That was the skill set Amos had. Um, yeah. so, so we like check their credentials via API. And then uh, if we like the person, we'll hire them. Um, how that works is we simply like, we keep the assets in our account. So it's for Axie, it's, it's three axes you need to go in and play the game. And we just attach a login and a password to that, um, to the, to that wallet. And so the player um, can jump on the, the game platform. They can use the email, the, the email login and the password. Uh, they don't get any sort of functional control of the assets. They can just play the game with them. And then uh, the, the currency they earn is transferred to the, to the wallet, which is again, still in our ownership. And then we just pay them by a smart contract. So, so how does that work with uh, now with the DAO model? Because that's obviously, that makes sense with just kind of as a company, you can just uh, sort of lease it to different players. Obviously, with yeah. the DAO, it's a decentralized autonomous organization. Is that essentially is the idea? Of the DAO is essentially just leasing it directly to players as well, and then uh, yeah, yeah, that's then, correct. So, I'm uh, oh, sorry, you continue. <laughs> oh no, I was just going to ask. Then, how does curation work? Obviously, because um, uh, obviously you can curate players directly. Uh, how does a DAO curate players uh, and, and sort of operate? Yeah, sure, no stress. Um, so yeah, so the DAO uh, retains ownership of the assets and, and does do the leasing. Uh, how that works is we have a DAO that's um, very democratic. We have a, a subcommittee model. So uh, the DAO will elect a subcommittee of people who manages decision makings for the DAO. And then the DAO, and then the, the subcommittee will report that back to the, the DAO community. Um, we kind of didn't want to kneecap functional decision making. So we decided to make a subcommittee of like five people. And that's really from most of our um, communication with uh, DAOs in the real world where they might have uh, a committee of like say 20 people, even 100 people, and it just doesn't really work for effective decision making. Uh, so we tried to go for more of a democratic structure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. A lot of projects in the Polkadot ecosystem I, I'm seeing sort of have the same sort of model, uh, just yeah. because a lot of the DAOs, uh, just as like a quick context for our listeners, a lot of the early DAOs on the Ethereum ecosystem, obviously Ethereum prioritizes sort of decentralization and security over everything else. And what happened is a lot of these DAOs got incredibly bogged down because every single decision is essentially a, uh, like a it's, it's a direct democracy uh, token holder vote. Uh, and so you saw a ton of apathy. People didn't want to vote, didn't want to sort of stay informed. And then it led to all the sorts of really bad outcomes. So I, I, one thing I, I definitely see a lot of sort of the bleeding edge DAOs now uh, use the subcommittee. Um, yes. And then essentially token holders, I, I presume, can kind of vote out members if they want or and stuff like that. Correct. Yeah. So we're looking to bake that in code as well. Like if someone does get voted out, they're out, and then you know the the wallet um, keys to the multi sig just get transferred over. So that's how we're 
really looking to structure that in the in a way that is like completely decentralized, but uses a, a, a like small subcommittee. Oh, Alex, I think. Yeah, so let's say that I'm a you know an individual who's not like knowledgeable at all about crypto, but I love video games and I learned sure. about uh, Perion and um, I'm I'm looking for a way to get involved. Is it what is the onboarding process like to join a guild? I mean, you obviously need sure. to be somewhat familiar with this space. You need to know what a DAO is and. Uh, but, but but is there is there an on ramping process for you to attract the kind of people yeah. that you're hoping for? So so you, first of all, you'd actually be surprised about how many people know absolutely nothing about crypto. Yeah, um, it doesn't actually, surprise me at all. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the reason we liked it so much. Is like when we set up our community, and I'll, I'll jump into the onboarding process in a sec. But when we set up our community, um, like ninety percent of the people weren't crypto native. They they never used crypto at all, and this was their first interaction. Hmm. Um, and like one guy, I remember he was so adamant he was going to set up a bank account and he was from like rural Philippines out on um, the island somewhere, couldn't, couldn't get access to like the, the correct ID to set up a bank. And I just said to him one day, I was like, look, you can, you can just convert the, the, the money you've earned, the tokens you've earned into US dollars on like the Ethereum blockchain. And like, that was it, you know, like for the, for the first time, like you kind of bank the people on the back end, you get them in with the game and then you can kind of establish them on the, um, on, on the on the crypto networks and they can kind of that's how they get their engagement um, when you say that as, what, what you're referring to is basically like they're earning rewards by doing this and then they're able correct. to convert those gains into a stable coin that trade that that you know exists on a blockchain so us a digital asset that's as good as dollars and it can be used like an increasingly wide array array of you know applications basically correct yeah and i think that's really important for someone who might be from say the rural Philippines or the developing world where they've never really had a chance to save any money outside of kind of under their pillow. Um, so yeah, we, we see that as a kind of a really valuable step in, in on like banking the unbanked, which is essentially like a huge part of why crypto came to be. Um, as far as the onboarding process for us, it, it's, it's relatively simple. Uh, we have a Discord community. Um, people complete a series of checks to validate that they're a real human being. Um, and then what we look for specifically is um, previous gaming skill. So if you've played League of Legends, Dota 2, uh, Mobile Legends, any of the kind of Counter-Strike franchise, you can come in and you can like fill out your credentials. Um, our system, like we set it up. So if that game has an API that you applied with, we'll check it on the back end and, and make sure your credentials are valid. If not, we just have some guys performing manual checks. Um, if this person is a, is a really high rank gamer, um, they get the call up. And so we just set up an uh, account uh, with some with some axes and just give them the login details and they can start playing the game. Um, we have a team of, of guys that are sort of feature regularly in the in the top 100 of axes, uh, for example, and they will they will select all of the teams. So you kind of get this um, really sort of top down, um, fantastic kind of base to jump off of uh, when you if you dove into a game. Um, right now, though, like half of our recruiting process is just poaching players from like the top 100 of Axie Infinity. Um, it's it's kind of just shortcutting the whole system. If someone's so, a, one of the top players, I know Andrew's like dying to jump in here, but if someone's yeah, already sure. one of the top players on Axie Infinity, they've got the Axies, they're playing, they're earning rewards. Like what's the incentive to join the guild? Because isn't, yeah. isn't part of this that, you know, not only are we going to onboard you to blockchain games, even if you may not be crypto native, but also we're basically going to front you what you like your table stakes to play the game right um so yeah. if you're already in that like um league table what's the what's the incentive great question and that's sort of a part of our uh, constantly evolving strategy is a lot of those top players so you, like you're in the top one you also you're also streaming so you're also getting a lot of eyeballs across your streams uh we tend to see for, for the for that kind of caliber of player there's a lot more value for perion if we just like sponsor them completely um and when we're, we're kind of like ignoring the yield factor here and saying mm. if we can get ten thousand eyeballs on perion it's actually more valuable for perion right. and i mean if you look at where this is right now is it's not quite esports ready but it is totally going to trend towards esports and if you kind of look at say teams like team solar mid um who recently signed like a 200 million plus um sponsorship deal with ftx like we'd like to buy that be that for web3 gaming um and as these games get more and more, uh, more closer to a kind of Western consumer market ready title, like we want to be that bridge that's ready to bring people over. And what's the thing they're going to look for is like, what are the esports teams of this space? 
so that's kind of how we're positioning for the for the future if that makes sense yeah yeah what, one other thing uh, on the future I, I was looking at your white paper and um i thought you broke it down really well in terms of your roadmap in terms into the three phases of yeah. uh foundations expansions and then uh metaverse yeah. Um, particularly excited about that third phase. Do you want to just talk a little bit about the three sections? Uh, I'm curious to learn exactly what. Yeah, what sure, 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 sure. Um, it's an interesting one. Like we, I haven't actually uh, revisited our white paper for a while. I probably need to, to update it with the kind of new direction. But our initial foundations was really just like finding a, a fantastic player base, establishing the DAO, um, establishing like the, the kind of basics um, for the kind of how the model would work, um, and then like moving into now really what our roadmap um, is looking like. It's quite interesting. Um, we see more value, like we looked at Axie Infinity um, and how that raised at like a, a double digit millions figure. And it ended up trading at like a fully diluted valuation of something like $35 billion. And so we see a lot of value for us is in taking a an early position in games, um, now using our network of streamers, which is around 3 million eyeballs in front of them. And then we become kind of a launch pad for these new titles coming out. And then we can just develop our name further and become sort of a mainstay of the space where people want to be attached to Perion um, because it's it's kind of the launch pad to, to get them to where they need to be. So that's how we're sort of positioning for now. Um, I think that's become a key part of our roadmap. Um, another, another big thing we're looking at really is just like building out the DAO infrastructure. So we just uh, completed the uh, tender, I think, the other day for... Uh, creating like our treasury smart contracts, which will allow us to start doing token buybacks and things like that. Um, as I mentioned, we're still just hiring competitive players like crazy. Um, we've just been interviewing CMOs. So speaking to some really interesting people there, I won't, won't um, divulge too much, but uh, we're really excited about that. And so once we, once we um, establish the frameworks, what we're building now is then we can kind of just become like completely integrated into this new metaverse ecosystem where we can be directly in games where you can see us sort of all around you and become this kind of, you know, multifaceted thing where if you're in an NFT game, you, you see Perry on there. And then yeah, how does, right. sorry, real quick. And then how does the, the sort of the perk token fit within this whole uh, ecosystem? Essentially like it, it functions as like a, a revenue share, right? Like if, if the DAO makes money, you hold the token, you can access sort of staking rewards. We plan to gamify our sort of staking rewards to a degree. Uh, which is something that's just the later in the roadmap. But if you kind of see it as like, hey, you make money, we make money. Um, if you hold the token, you can um, have access to an equivalent amount of, of rewards that the DAO has, has earned through gameplay. The question I was going to ask is you mentioned uh, Axie Infinity and the, the value of that game um, yeah. and how, how big it got. Yeah. But it's not really an apples to apples comparison with, with a guild. It's almost more like, What's the value of the NBA versus the value of an individual franchise, I guess? Um, I mean, that's how people in the e-gaming space so sometimes frame it for people in a mainstream audience. But, you know, if the NBA has a value of 25 billion or 50 billion, whatever it might be, you know, individual franchises can sell for or be valued at, you know, three, four, five billion dollars, right? So um, do you... I guess the question's around valuation of what guild, um, you know, and what where, where, where does the value accrue in this whole ecosystem, right? Is it is it something that you can tie directly to the kinds of revenue share that you create that token holders participate in, or is there something else that you're looking at? Um, I, I think like really what you're getting, if you say invest in, a, in an organization like Paragon, and this, this is exactly how we're positioning, is you get access to um, kind of a bucket of like, probably the most, the, the games that have the highest chance of success within the NFT gaming landscape. Um, and, and sort of through the lens of, of a team who is kind of lives and breathes gaming. Um, like we have data scientists on the back end, modeling game economies uh, and whatnot for, for um, sustainability. So essentially what you get access to is like a bucket of, you know, different um, game assets across games that have like a very high percentage chance of, of winning in the, um, in the play to earn sphere. And then, through holding the token, you can access like some of the um, the rev share or, or whatnot that the the guild you know, the guild earns through having these positions in in um in, in a VC sense, and also like if um, if the kind of yield farming through the play to earn mechanics is still a large component as well, you can you can access it through that. So 
it's really just like accessing the revenue streams of the organization. Yeah. And then uh, that's, that's very interesting. I, one of the things I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my heads around is um, the DAO is the one that owns these NFT assets uh, that, that are, that it's leasing. If I'm a, if I'm someone that has NFT assets, but I don't know how to lease, or obviously I'm not doing it at the same level that an organization like Perion's doing, is there a way for me to, uh, do I, is my only option to buy the, the, the perk token or am I able to sort of, uh, sort of lease my NFT to the DAO, which then leases it to uh, players. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, it's something that we do see a couple of organizations exploring. Uh, we looked at it initially, but the kind of workload for like benefit to the DAO didn't really make a ton of sense. Like we thought there was some some much better angles in the the positions we're sort of taking um, in our, in what we're doing now. Um, but there are certainly organizations doing that where you can sort of take your assets and say, hey, give me a percentage of the, of the rev share. We sort of saw the, the biggest issue with that, right? Is like we were able to get like reasonably high yields because we selected the assets and we, um, that's like a really important component, we, especially with an Axie. There was something like 12 million uh, combinations of cards because Axies all have like these different skills and you can breed them to combine them. The issue we saw is that like most of those axes someone's going to try and lend you are probably just going to be trash. If they just bought them without really having any insight into the, the game mechanics themselves. Um, so the kind of potential yield on those was, was relatively low. So we just thought it's not really worth the kind of um, huge HR responsibilities. Like you might need to hire a thousand people and they might not be earning that much. So we, we just thought there were, there were better things to focus on. Um, and that was mostly like being early on games and acting as a launch pad for them because then we could really succeed with like the thousand or 3000 X's. This is like what Axie did um, with their DAO governance token. Like that's the, that those were the things that we really wanted to be on board with um, rather than kind of zooming into the micro and just focusing on like trying to extract tiny yields. So yeah, that, that was kind of our reasoning for not diving in ourselves, but there's certainly our organizations doing it. It almost, it strikes me that the world of web three gaming is a new gold rush and that there are you know millions of people moving west so to speak into this world and that the gaming guilds aren't out there mining the gold they're providing the picks and shovels right the the yeah. assets themselves are the things that help you to generate the yield of the commodity whatever it is so if you yeah. if you believe that blockchain based games are going to become one of the dominant categories of games uh, because people love to you know earn and own and you know um, exchange and do all these kinds of things in these rich environments then the demand for guilds and the assets they have is going to grow significantly so it seems like you're in a really good part of the market having said that with any gold rush there's going to be hundreds of new entrants that are trying to do the same thing so what, and I know the gaming guild space is crowded today. So what are the ways in which you differentiate yourself relative to, if it's not competitors and other players in the market going after the same players? I guess, yeah, it, is, sure. I guess it is competitors um, in a way. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think like this, um, we kind of touched on this earlier, right? Like where we are, very interested we're very interested in acting more as a launch pad um and so like we think there's huge value in investing in games early because we got sort of fantastic deal through through our network of vcs um we sort of have some in the, the some of the best in the industry so they, they sort of act like this initial filtration process and then we can just go out and speak to some of the most sort of compelling games in, in, within the within the crypto space um and get access to early round investment and then what we have that most traditional VCs don't have is we now have a network of streamers. So across our network of gaming streamers, we have around 3 million eyeballs. So we can act really functionally as, as a launch pad for titles and get them in front of the audiences that they're going to need to succeed. Um, as we kind of build that out, we can also bring in like the, the initial esports um, scene, which if you kind of look at twitch.tv, the most successful games there are like all esports ready and they all have like budding esports scene. So we can bring that first competitive layer of play. And then from there, we just continue to develop our name and become kind of this synonymous um, organization within the, within the ecosystem. Um, I think, yeah, as well, like when we see games, as I mentioned, like 
become ready for that Western consumer market, um, those Western consumers are used to the esports team. And so they'll be looking for like, what's the team that I can relate to from like the traditional gaming world? Yeah. And like, we don't want to be too different. Like we don't want to kind of scare them off with this whole new world where it just all looks completely different. So we're really trying to be that bridge into um, the traditional gaming market because we, we firmly believe that it's coming. Yeah. Well, we, we believe that as well. Um, and just to clarify something, you mentioned that the, is it the DAO itself that is investing into what you view to be promising new Web3 games, basically? Yes. Yeah. So, so, the, and the, so the DAO token represents not only, you know, a rev share on the growth of the operating model, but also a book value of promising, you know, new investments. And, and then how do you monetize Correct. that? Like, is the monetization for the investment side via the same governance mechanism as the gaming decisions? Or have you not yet had a, an opportunity to test that out because it's still relatively new? Obviously, it's still relatively new, but it'll essentially be like on sale of the assets, then we can like distribute the, the revenue there, if that yeah. makes sense. What about like in time? Like, like, I wonder if you could do to DAO, to token holders of the PERC token, their pro rata of a given token, if they're staking, it's like an airdrop, right? Uh, or something like that. I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting experiment or th thought experiment. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, we, we plan to, through our distribution mechanism, actually buy back PERC and distribute PERC. So it's it's like once that uh, those contracts are set up, it's going to be quite interesting, I think, for the actual token itself. In, yeah. Is, yeah, sorry, Andrew, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, I was just going to ask, like, given that it's so important, uh, as you mentioned, to be kind of at the bleeding edge of where these games are going to be so that you get the 3,000, 4,000 X. Um, obviously, Axie Infinity, I, I, I think we all kind of agree. We still think it has a lot of uh, sort of growth trajectory over the next couple of years, but it is also a multi-billion dollar sort of uh, game at this point. What, what are the newer games uh, that you think uh, that, are interest, that are interesting to you or you're sort of looking at uh, besides, I guess, Axie? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. And like, it's really funny. Like what we've seen is initially like all the crypto games, it was by like completely crypto heads who were just like, oh, we're going to make a game. And like since Axie kind of peaked, I think it was around four months ago, we've just seen like an influx of like AAA developers. And it's, it's really funny because all they're really seeing, like all, well, for the most part, right? A lot, of the, a lot of what these developers are seeing is like, oh, we just need to make a game and attach NFTs to it and we'll be like filthy rich. Um, very few of them actually kind of break down that economic model and say like, okay, Axie was actually successful because their economic systems accrued a ton of value in the governance token. And that's what, that's what kind of drove that entire economic machine. So like the biggest development we're seeing is just like, there are some like, um, there's some amazing gaming talent coming in um, and they're just kind of slowly getting their head around like what it means to, to make an economy in the crypto space. So those titles that kind of operate at the intersect of those two things are the ones we're really most excited about. Um, and then we just kind of look at things like, like sex exposure and like, do we have a MOBA on the book? Do we have an FPS? Um, are we looking at mobile games? Are we looking at PC web, web browser based? Um, and so for, from there, like, it, it's just, it's just incredibly exciting. Like we, um, we're getting ready for the next wave of games, which I think like realistically will be in like two, three years as all these games have you know, development timelines. Um, but it, it's about to get really, really interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I like, I've often thought about some of these massive, um, you know, multiplayer open RPG, open environment RPGs, or, or even a, a game like Grand Theft Auto, like, Mm -hmm. And the, the, I just, you know, I mean, I, this, I'm dating myself, but that my peak video gaming time period was between the years of 1994 and 2004. And, uh, you know, I'm just thinking like, even, even back then, like, you know, the, the number of people playing Grand Theft Auto and like people in that environment, like what is the economy of GTA? Like I can only imagine um, it's, yeah. in, it's like tens of billions of dollars in terms of actual economic activity you could unlock from that. I mean, that is like the metaverse <laughs> to me in a correct. way, these kinds yeah, of correct. environments. Um, yeah. at, that these web two, we never even really got to this discussion about, you know, how do the web two develop game developers think about these models? I know that it's a bit divisive or controversial. Like I know some are saying this is the future and others are saying it's destroying video games. Maybe as a, as a final kind of uh, 
topic. Why don't you just share your thoughts on that? Yeah, of course. I, I think like Web3 gaming actually means, it, I think something really valuable for the developers. I mean, if you look at kind of the, the latest trends in gaming, especially on mobile, it's, it's all free to play. Um, and, and what a free to play game is when you develop that, it, what it entails is you make a game that's initially fun and like quite addictive, but then you just put in a ton of pain points and just make it really frustrating. I'm seeing people spend money. Um, sorry, someone's knocked on our door. <laughs> oh um, give me one second. Sure. This is the dog that made you that made you millions from the Buddhist <laughs> dog episode from earlier. Is this a, is this planned? The dog appearance on the show? <laughs> a special guest. Yeah, the special guest, the dog whale. Here he comes. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's hilarious. That's amazing. All I do is bend over and pick up crap when I'm walking my dog. No one's, I never introduced to a brilliant entrepreneur. You know, <laughs> here's my vision for the world. That never happened on a dog walk. Yeah, um, move. Right, guys. yeah. my dog <laughs> thinks she's a, a bit of a guard dog. Yeah, um, no problem. <laughs> yeah, so just going back to what we were talking about, um, like the, the biggest thing for that, right, is like people previously had to make their games frustrating to get people to spend money. Yeah. Um, whereas now moving to this kind of play to earn space is it's, the secret sauce is like, how do I make my game economy as engaging as possible? Right. Because that, that's what that's what drives value to the protocol, which essentially just means like, how do I make my game fun? <laughs> so I think for, for like video game developers, this is a, a really fantastic thing if they can yeah. capitalize on it and use it to, to, their, to, to good effect. Uh, sounds terrific. Boy, I, I feel like a dog on a bone um, thinking about this perk token after this conversation. <laughs> Um, oh, it's, so been a great, it, it's been a great discussion. Thanks so much for joining the show. Um, shout out to the dog guest appearance. Um, <laughs> with him, but your background's blurred out. Uh, really yeah. great discussion. Um, you know, where can people learn more, follow you guys, and what you're up to? I'm sure our audience yeah. will be really keen to find out. Yeah, sure. I think um, the best jump off point is probably our website, uh, perion.gg. Uh, we're also on Twitter at Perion Dow. Um, you can find me. I'm also at Mitch underscore Perion. But yeah, that, those are probably our primary platforms of communication. And then from there, you can jump into the white paper. Or the, we run a pretty active medium where we kind of talk about our thoughts on, on the space. Um, I, I tend to do most of the writing there. So you can learn more about me um, through that as well. Terrific. Well, thanks. We'll have to have you back on the show later on. When uh, when the Dow is up a thousand X and we can say, see, I told you so to the people who do yeah. it. No, I'm just kidding. Well, maybe not. Yeah. Let's All take, right. Let's take, yeah, yeah, thanks, Mitch. Really appreciate it. Well, Andrew. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Talk to you soon. Okay. Take Bye. care. Bye. The information contained herein does not constitute an offer or solicitation by anyone in the United States or in any other jurisdiction in which such an offer or solicitation is not authorized or to any person to whom it is unlawful to make such an offer or solicitation. Prospective investors who are not residents in Canada should contact their financial advisor to determine whether securities of the funds may be lawfully sold in their jurisdiction.